Hello, and thank you for joining us on this study in the book of Acts. We are in Acts chapter 25, and because of the concerns concerning the pandemic that's sweeping the country and indeed even the world, we are trying something different so that our study in the book of Acts will continue for the members where I work, the East Side Church of Christ in Baytown, Texas. We want to continue our studies, and this may be one of the ways that we can continue to do that. I said that we're going to be in Acts chapter 25. We're going to begin right about in the middle of the chapter, beginning in verse 13 here in just a moment, but we'll go through some of the background that gets us to this point. But before we do that, I'd like to lead us in a prayer. Will you bow with me? Our God in heaven, we're thankful to you that we can study your word, and even though we cannot be together in a physical way, we're thankful for technology that brings us together, at least in spirit. We're thankful, Father in heaven, that you love us, you continue to watch over us, and that you will ease us and calm our fears about all the things that there are to be concerned about. We pray that this study in this book that tells so much about the beginnings and the continued work of your early church will help us to know what we can do, even today, to please you. We ask that you'll help us in this study to learn, to understand, to apply. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in Acts chapter 25, Paul is about to give his, what's going to be actually his fifth defense of the charges that had been brought against him by certain Jews. Uh, Paul had been in prison for a little over two years, and this, these charges that had been brought against him were done uh, by Jews who had assumed certain things that were not true. And because of those untrue things, they had made slanderous charges against Paul that also were not true. Now, we had looked during our one of our earlier studies where instead of being handed back over to the Jews in order to be uh, tried by them, he knew what they wanted. They wanted to kill him. Instead of being handed back over to the Jews, they were going to... Rather, Paul thought that his best chances were to stand before Caesar. And so, as a Roman, he appealed to Caesar, as was his right. Now, Paul gets this opportunity not just to appeal his case before Caesar in Rome, but actually in fulfillment of his own desire to go to Rome, as well as the prediction made by Jesus to Paul personally that he would go to Rome. But Paul has stood before certain rulers, and he had been giving various defenses, which really is the same defense. He just denied all the charges because they flat weren't true. Uh, but he has already made defenses to the Jews right after they accused him in, in Acts chapter 22. He'd made uh, a defense before the, the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin council, in Acts 23. He made his defense before Felix, a governor who had left him in prison for two years. He made his defense after that to Festus, the, the one who took over for Felix. And now he's about to make his defense before a, uh, a king. He fancied himself to be the king of the Jews. This would be Herod Agrippa. And if the name Herod seems familiar to you, well, that's for good reason. Uh, the Herod family is, is prominent in the New Testament, and we'll take a look at, at some of the ways in which their prominence actually slides into uh, infamacy as their goings-on are anything but good and ethical. And we'll talk about those things. We want to know what's going on with Paul and how he's going to be able to make this defense against yet another ruler. And so let's read. Let's begin reading in Acts chapter 25, begin in verse 13. It says, Now when several days had elapsed, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and paid their respects to Festus. While they were spending many days there, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There is a man who was left as a prisoner by Felix. And when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the, of the Jews brought charges against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answered them that it was not the custom of the Romans to hand over any man 
before the accused meets his accusers face to face and has an opportunity to make his defense against the charges. So after they assembled here, I did not delay, but on the next day took my seat on the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought before me. And when the accusers stood up, they began bringing charges against him, not of such crimes as I was expecting, but they simply had some points of disagreement with him about their own religion and about a dead man, Jesus, whom Paul asserted to be alive. Being at a loss how to investigate such matters, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there stand trial on these matters. But when Paul appealed to be held in custody for the emperor's decision, I ordered him to be kept in custody until I send, uh, until I send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. Festus must have thought that as king of the Jews, the self-proclaimed king of the Jews, Herod Agrippa would have some, some insight into how to deal with this problem that he had. We mentioned in an earlier study uh, regarding Festus's history, he was a fellow who had inherited uh, what to many was thought to be a, a, a problem child. The Jews were a community that the Romans thought was a, a, a tinderbox. And they had to be very careful, and sometimes they were very overhanded in the way that they that they dealt with the way that they 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 squashed rebellions or even things that they thought might be rebellious by the Jews. Well, Festus, in spite of the fact that he had risen to some prominence in the the Roman governmental hierarchy, uh, was thought by many to be just incompetent. He was not a, a good administrator or a good ruler. And, and that comes forth, I think, in the way that he uh, addresses uh, uh, Agrippa. He wants to know, what, how do I do this? How do I handle this? I, if I'm going to send him to, to Caesar, I'm going to have some need to write credible accusations against him. And remember, this had been the problem before with the Roman soldier who had sent Paul to Caesarea in the first place. Uh, he didn't know what to write about him. He thought that this was all just a misunderstanding between Paul and the Jews, and it, as far as anybody could see, there were no Roman laws that were being broken. So the procurator, Felix, has a problem. How am I going to deal with what charges I should write against Paul? And so he starts talking about what it is that they brought to him. He says, now, the things that they brought were not of such crimes as I was expecting, but they simply had some points of disagreement with him about their own religion and about a dead man, Jesus, whom Paul asserted to be alive. Now, No doubt Festus was thinking that there should have been some major law-breaking going on here. But Festus, like the others before him, didn't see evidence of that going on. In fact, we see that these crimes that were concerning to him were not crimes at all. In fact, what he says is what we've got here really are just some points of disagreement. He says, first about their own religion. Now, you recall that the Jews thought that Paul was some kind of heretic, that he had gone off the rails and was teaching something that was absolutely contrary to the law of Moses. Some of the, the charges that they had brought up against Paul were that he spoke against Moses, against the law, against the temple, against the customs that they were brought up with under Moses. And of course, all of that was, was, was not true. Paul, Paul was saying that all of those things had a purpose and a reason, and they're all fulfilled in Jesus. In fact, Jesus is the one whom all the law and the prophets testified of. And that's the other part to this misunderstanding that's going on. They have these questions about a dead man, Jesus, whom Paul asserted to be alive. Now, if you recall in your own study of 1 Corinthians, in chapter 15, Paul talks about the fact that, that there are many witnesses 
to the resurrected Christ. It's not just an assertion that he or his fellow apostles had made. This was fact. This was true. Jesus actually was alive, and there were many witnesses, over 500, Paul says, who had witnessed the living, breathing, resurrected Jesus. Now, of course, to Festus, this makes no matter because he thinks that, that Jesus certainly is dead because, after all, who goes around getting resurrected? Well, that was ridiculous to him. Of course, not to Paul. He knew better. But he's in this quandary, and he explains all this to Agrippa. He says, I don't, I don't quite know what to do about this. And Agrippa is intrigued. In verse 22 of Acts 25, Agrippa says, I would like to hear this man myself. And Festus says, you got it. You'll listen to him. Tomorrow you shall hear him. And so Paul begins, or has the opportunity at least, to make his defense now against someone who at least knows something about the religion of the Jews and maybe even something about the prophets and what they foretold themselves. Now, I mentioned before that you may be familiar with uh, the name Agrippa. And that's because, well, maybe not the name Agrippa, but the name Herod. And that's because uh, the family of Herod uh, is very prominent in the New Testament. Let's continue reading in Acts 25. In verse 23, it tells us that on the next day, when Agrippa came together with Bernice amid great pomp, and entered the auditorium accompanied by the commanders and the prominent men of the city. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa and all you gentlemen here present with us, you see this man about whom all the people of the Jews appealed to me, both at Jerusalem and here, loudly declaring that he should not live any longer. But I found out that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and since he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to send him. Yet I have nothing definite about him to write to my Lord. Therefore I have brought him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the investigation has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seems absurd to me in sending a prisoner not to indicate also the charges against him. Festus lays it out for King Agrippa. And he wants him to know that there's <laughs> help needed. He wants to know what he's going to do in order to write down the credible charges against Paul. I want you to notice some things about Agrippa and his family tree. King Agrippa was ascended from King Herod the Great, a, a ruthless man. He was ingenious at building things. He was a great builder, and I guess you could call him a competent administrator, but he ruled with an iron fist. In fact, there were some who said it was safer to be Herod's pig than it was his son's because he was not above putting his own sons to death for perceived uh, assignations against his throne. Here's another view of what it, the twisted family tree of Herod and the ways in which uh, justice was perverted by those who, who were his descendants. If you'll look with me here, we see that Herod the Great had children, of course. Uh, Herod Agrippa II, the one whom we're talking about in Acts chapter 25 and then into 26, was a son of Herod Agrippa I, who had killed James back in Acts chapter 12. And it was his uncle Herod Antipas who had killed John the Baptizer. Remember, he had him beheaded. Herod Agrippa's sister, Drusilla, whom we had seen before in Acts, uh, was married to Felix, the procurator before the present Festus now. Uh, and his other sister Bernice was currently engaged in a scandalous and some said incestuous relationship with her brother Herod Agrippa II. 
Herod Agrippa the Great, the one from whom all these had come from, is probably most well known to us as the one who ordered the slaughter of the children in Matthew chapter 2, looking for this one whom the Magi from the East called the King of the Jews. He was looking for Jesus. And he was looking to kill him because in Herod the Great's mind, he was the king of the Jews. And no doubt this was the mindset that he had infected his progeny with. Those who were his children probably thought this way as well. And it's ironic to me that Agrippa and Bernice, brother and sister, who many believe were actually living together as husband and wife, uh, would listen to these things concerning the risen Jesus Christ and, and faith regarding him, since it was their great-grandfather who had slaughtered the innocent children of Judea in, in, in his vain attempt to murder Jesus in his, in his infancy. But that's what we have. And Paul has an opportunity to make his defense now between this, before this fellow who has this long history of murder, and intrigue and sin and immorality of every stripe running through his family tree. Well, let's continue reading together. Read with me if you will as we begin Acts chapter 26. In Acts 26 and verse 1, Agrippa said to Paul, you're permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. In regard to all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I am about to make my defense before you today, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Now, Paul is not just buttering up. In fact, he's not buttering up Agrippa at all. He's appealing to a sense of fairness, he's, whatever sense of fairness there may be there. He's, a sense, he's, he's appealing to whatever Agrippa might know concerning the law. Because if he could convince Agrippa that there was no breaking of the law, either Roman or Jewish, then Agrippa could see that there were no credible charges to be, to be written up. That there was nothing that Paul had done that was deserving of, of prison or death. And so the testimony before Agrippa is going to bring together the themes of all the charges that have been made against Paul, which he'd already debunked very well before. Uh, but what this actually does is it fulfills the promise that Paul had made, or rather that Jesus had made to Paul concerning who it was he would stand up and give his testimony to. In Acts chapter 9, in verses 15 and 16, the Lord had said to Ananias, who was about to go and talk to Paul, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my sake. Well, this is now Paul's opportunity to do just that, just as he had been doing. He's been standing before Gentiles before. He's standing before kings, and he had certainly had been standing before the sons of Israel in order to bring them testimony about Jesus. Paul goes into his defense, uh, reminding uh, Agrippa of his uh, history uh, in one of the most strictest sects of Judaism. He talks about the fact that he was at one point a Pharisee. In Acts 26 and in verse 4, read with me. So then, all Jews know my manner of life from my youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and at Jerusalem, since they have known about me for a long time. If they're willing to testify that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion, and now I'm standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, the promise to which our twelve tribes hope to attain, as they earnestly serve God night and day. And for this hope, O King, I am being accused by Jews. Why is it considered incredible among you people 
if God does raise the dead. So Paul, as he talks about his background as a Pharisee, he talks about a pedigree, a religious pedigree that he has that any faithful Jew would have would have envied. He explained that from his very earliest inclinations. He had been sympathetic to his countrymen. Their, their religion had, had earnestly believed the promises made in their scriptures. In fact, he, he said that I'm standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, the promise to which our 12 tribes hope to attain. Now that promise was first made to Abraham way back in Genesis chapter 12. In fact, we're going to turn back there. We're going to turn to Genesis chapter 12, and we're going to read these promises that the Jews had staked themselves upon. In Genesis chapter 12, begin with me, if you will, in verse 1. Genesis 12 and in verse 1. It says, Yahweh said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all of the families of the earth will be blessed. Now inside of that promise, there was the idea that there would come from Abram's descendants, someone who would bring that promise along, that through him, through his seed, all of the families of the earth, would be blessed. They had this hope that they carried with them throughout the generations and this was a, a, a promise that was not only reiterated by Moses but Moses foretold of one who would come according to promise that would also help the Jews to continue in their steadfastness to God. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, go there with me, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, Moses in one of his final speeches before the children cross over into the promised land and he himself is not able to, to cross over, he tells them of a promise of someone who's coming. In verse 15 of Deuteronomy 18, Moses said, Yahweh your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. This is according to all that you asked of Yahweh your God in Horeb on the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of Yahweh my God. Let me not see this great fire any more, or I will die. Yahweh said to me, They've spoken well. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Do you recall in the Gospels, there were some who wondered whether or not Jesus was this prophet. And certainly, he indeed was. Even the prophets told of someone who was coming, who would not merely be a spokesman for God, but would actually be a sacrifice that would give himself for all people. Isaiah chapters 52 and 53 are some of the most famous messianic promises of Jesus and his suffering. Paul says, all of this is according to the promise. I'm standing trial for something that my people eagerly hope to attain to. So he lays this out before Agrippa and reminds Agrippa that everything that he is about, even before he became a Christian, when he was a Pharisee, all those things he believed, all the promises, all that the prophets foretold, everything concerning this Messiah who was coming, all of that Paul believed. And when Christianity began as this movement, well, Paul as a Pharisee opposed it. And he went from Paul the Pharisee to being Paul the persecutor. Read with me as we continue. In Acts chapter 26, we're going to continue from verse 9. So then, Paul said, I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. 
And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. While so enraged, as I was journeying to Damascus, while the, with the authority and commission of the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me, and those who were journeying with me. Now we'll stop there for just a moment. I want you to see something. Paul had spoken often about his persecuting ways, and he's, he doesn't spare the, the rage at which he felt back when he was a Pharisee and trying to round up certain Christians uh, for imprisonment and for death if possible. In fact, when you think about all the things that Paul had done, he lists a great number of them here. He talks about the fact that I, I locked up the saints. Now, back then, to him, they weren't saints. They were heretics. But now, of course, they're his brother saints. He says, I locked them up. He says, not only that, but I voted for their death. I cast votes that they would be, that they would be uh, killed for the blasphemy that he thought they were perpetrating. He said, I punished them in the synagogues. I don't know how he did that. Perhaps what he means is that he got them excommunicated. He got them thrown out of the synagogues. For, the, for, for Jews, that was a big deal. If you were thrown out of the synagogue, that meant that all of your social contacts, all of your religious contacts, all of that were completely cut off. You were isolated from the community of people that you had known all your life. Paul goes on to say that not only that, but I forced them to blaspheme. By that I understand that he tried his best to get them to renounce Jesus, to somehow get them to admit that, that Jesus was not the Son of God. And of course, that would be blasphemy. He talked about how he had not only forced them to blaspheme, but he said, I was furiously, furiously enraged at them. Back in, in Acts chapter 8, it tells us that back then when Paul was called Saul, he was breathing threats and murder against the church. He was so overwhelmed with this feeling of utter hatred for these people. And he says, so zealous was I to stamp out what he thought was a, a cult. He says, I pursued them even to foreign cities. Now, anybody would appreciate the zeal, however misplaced it might have been, that Paul had given to the mission that he thought himself was God-given. He was out to, to squash this thing called Christianity and he would do it any way that he possibly could. But something happened. Something happened that began on the road to Damascus. In verse 12, let's reread that. Paul said, While so engaged, as I was journeying to Damascus, with the authority and commission of the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. On that road... To Damascus everything began to change for Paul the persecutor Paul got the opportunity to speak face to face with the one whom he had been persecuting and it's interesting to me that we considered this before in another class that 
Jesus says, I'm the one you're persecuting. Well, Paul wasn't persecuting Jesus personally, was he? He was persecuting the believers of Jesus. He was persecuting the followers of Jesus. And so closely does Jesus identify with those who are following him that to persecute them is to persecute him. It's interesting to me that in verse 14, Paul says, or Paul is told that you're kicking against the goads. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And that might be uh, in reference to Paul's futile rejection of the gospel. Everything had been pushing him towards belief in Jesus. Everything that he said he believed about the promise that had come to Abraham, everything that he said he believed in the law of Moses, everything that he said he believed that was spoken through the prophets was meant to guide him toward Jesus. And Jesus says, it's hard for you to kick against those goads that lead you to me. And so Paul describes the fact that he went from Pharisee to persecutor to faithful proclaimer of the gospel. Read with me as we continue in chapter 26. In verse 19, Paul said, So, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem, and then throughout all the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. For this reason some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. So having obtained help from God, I stand to this day, testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that the Christ was to suffer, and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. And we'll stop there for just a moment. Paul says something here. He says, there was a turning point for me. And he says, and because of this, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision. His consistency in obeying this heavenly vision is proof that when he really investigated it, he found Christianity entirely consistent with everything that the law and the prophets wrote. He, stood, he stayed true to the gospel message uh, in that men ought to repent, that they ought to turn to God, that they ought to live lives faithful to God, showing that they've repented, showing that there are fruits of repentance. Verse 20 says, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. He says, all of this is entirely consistent with what I'd always believed. Now for Paul, it took a a personal appearance by Jesus to, to shake him up enough to, to get him to, to see that. And when Ananias in Acts chapter 9 comes to him and tells him that Jesus had chosen him to be his proclaimer, by that time he was, he was more than ready and willing to, to not just reconsider everything, but to change his entire perspective about what he had previously believed concerning this movement called the way or Christianity. And so he says, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision. No, he didn't. In fact, he had turned himself around and worked to turn as many other people around as he possibly could. He says, I kept declaring even to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God. Now, the Jews before whom Paul had laid his case out were utterly enraged at the fact that he would take what they considered as a personal promise from God to them as a people and extend it to, to Gentiles. They believed that there were only two kinds of people in the world, Jews and Gentiles. And he didn't want to be a Gentile. In fact, there's, there's a saying among rabbis that one of the prayers that they prayed was that they were grateful to God that they had not made them Gentile. 
they believed that Gentiles were merely kindling for the fires of hell. That's how, that's how little they thought of, of Gentiles. And Paul had said that this, this charge, this mission that I had received, to which I was not disobedient, had me declaring to everyone who would listen, even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God. And of course, for the Jews, this was this is just about as big a no-no as you could get in their eyes. And so Paul says, it was for this reason that some Jews seized me. You recall that before, the when Paul was in was in Jerusalem uh, three or four chapters earlier, they had thought that Paul had taken a Gentile into the temple and that's what set this whole persecution against Paul off uh, and of course whenever Paul tried to describe or explain to them that he was following the mission that was given to him by his Lord by whom should be by, by who should be their Lord as well Jesus uh, that to go to the Gentiles was all in the great plan of God at the mere mention of Gentiles, it would just set the Jews off. They just couldn't listen to that anymore. It was about as offensive to them as it could possibly be. Paul reiterates that his seizure by the Jews was inappropriate since his message was simply the culmination of, of what their own prophets had said, what Moses himself had said would take place. And yet again, we find where Paul places Jesus' resurrection at the center of it all and as a proclamation of light to all the people and this is keeping in right in step with Isaiah's prophecy of Yahweh's servant we're going to go to Isaiah Isaiah chapter 42 Isaiah 42 and we're going to read what Isaiah through inspiration had to say concerning this coming Messiah. In Isaiah chapter 42, in Isaiah 42, beginning in verse 6, God through the prophet says, I am Yahweh. I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. And I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. Also in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 49, in Isaiah 49, if we turn to Isaiah chapter 49 and we look, beginning there in verse 6, the question is, or rather the statement is, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations, so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says Yahweh, the Redeemer of Israel, and His Holy One, to the despised one, to the one abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers. Kings will see and arise, princes will also bow down, because of Yahweh who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. Did you see there how often God through the prophet had foretold that there would be one who would be as a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, and not just to his people himself or themselves, but to peoples everywhere. Back in Acts chapter 26, Paul says this very thing. Everything that he says is right in line with what the prophets had predicted. Again, read with me in Acts chapter 26, in verse 23, that the Christ was to suffer, and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. And, of course, this, this is, is what, what got, got the Jews so enraged about Paul's mission, the, the fact, fact that he, he would dare to take it to the Gentiles, when this is what God had promised all along. Paul finally makes a 
One final plea. Back in Acts 26, beginning in verse 24. It says, while Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. But Paul says, I am not out of my mind. Most excellent, Felix. But I utter words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters. And I speak to him also with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things escape his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. Agrippa replied to Paul, In a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian? And Paul said, I would wish to God that whether in a short time or a long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Well, we see that Festus' loud declaration is just evidence of his ignorance. He has no idea what's going on. He has no idea that Paul's entire speech is just peppered and laced with promises and prophecy that any level-headed Jew would have recognized as coming from the Word of God. But that's not what they were interested in. That's certainly not what Festus was interested in. And though Paul called it sober truth, he just couldn't comprehend it. He couldn't apprehend it for himself. However, Agrippa did know something about these sacred writings. And Paul makes allusion to that. He, he, he tells him in verse 26 that I speak to him in confidence since I'm persuaded that none of these things escape his notice for this has not been done in a corner. No, by now Christianity is, is, is sweeping the country. In fact, Paul had made it so that it would begin to sweep the entire world. No, this wasn't done in a corner. It was done in such a way that people who were of a sincere heart, who were of an open mind, could take all the evidence, could weigh it for themselves, and see certainly that Jesus was not just for the Jews. Jesus is for all men. Agrippa seems to think that perhaps uh, Paul is trying to convert him. And of course, he was. Paul says, I wish that everybody were like me, except for these chains. Far from begging to be free, like Agrippa and Festus and Bernice, he wished that everyone would be like him. Though he was in chains, Paul was the one who was free, truly free, free from sin, free from the mindset that he had been enslaved to for so long. Paul was finally free, even though he wore the chains of a, a Roman prisoner. All of this is too much for the king and his wife. In verse 30 of Acts 26, it says that the king stood up and the governor and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. And when they had gone aside, they began talking to one another, saying, This man is not doing anything worthy of death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Their abrupt rising and leaving it seems to indicate that, that they've had enough. They don't want to listen to any more. But yet later on, they, they agree together that, that Paul is innocent and that if he hadn't appealed to Caesar, then perhaps he would have been set free. But I wonder that in the face of such severe Jewish opposition, if they would have set Paul free. The Jews were still mightily opposed to Paul. And in fact, that's the, that's the tragedy of the Jews in Acts. They were God's people. The, the prophets were their prophets. Christ was their Messiah. His resurrection fulfilled their hopes. But still in large part, they were 
unpersuaded. And their tragic story continues all the way to the end of Acts and, and even to this day, as the Jews, so many, futilely wait for the arrival of another Messiah, a different Messiah, who's not coming. I appreciate you being with me as we study through this book of Acts. It's good to think about these things and, and ask ourselves certain questions. One of the things that we had looked at earlier is in how Paul comported himself as he made his defense. We don't see Paul ever losing his temper as he stands before these people. We see him giving logical, reasonable, plausible evidence for the things that he had given his life for, for what Jesus was all about. Certainly, in this time of uncertainty, confusion, and worry, we can show people that there is a way that they can put their trust in a Messiah who's come, in a Lord who is above all. Again, thanks for listening. I appreciate you being with us. May God bless you.